Bangalore, Center for Development Studies is delighted to host the 12th Foundation Lecture on Fiscal Federalism in a Regulated Open Economy towards a new federal compact in the presence of a great dais. CDS is proud to have this event in the presence of two of our great alumni. The speaker of the session, Dr. Sri Haseeb Brabu, former finance minister of Jammu and Kashmir and an active member of the GST Council. He has been involved with national economic policy making at the highest level for many years and is associated with government and corporate policy making in various capacities. The session will be chaired by Dr. T.M. Thomas Isaac, the former finance minister of Kerala, who might not need an introduction in our community space. I invite Professor C. V. Ramani, Director of CDS, to welcome the gathering. Thank you and uh, good evening. As we, we all know, CDS was founded on October 19, uh, 1970. And today we commemorate our 53rd Foundation Day. Since 2012, we have been celebrating this occasion with a lecture delivered by a distinguished researcher or academician. And uh, welcome to the 12th Foundation Day lecture. Eminent scholars, including Professor Kaushik Basu, Professor Ashni Deshpande and Professor Amit Badri and among many others have delivered the Foundation Day lectures in previous years. Today we have the honor of welcoming Mr. Hasib Drabu, a distinguished alumnus of CDS as our speaker. Dr. Thomas Isaac, another esteemed alumnus of CDS will preside over the event. And beyond their shared CDS alumni status, our speaker and chair have other noteworthy commonalities in their professional lives. Firstly, both are renowned public figures with a deep academic interest in matters related to public finance and development. Secondly, they have both served as finance ministers with one representing the northernmost border state of Jammu and Kashmir and the other representing the southernmost uh, state of Kerala. Further, both have been members of the GST Council. Today is also a special occasion uh, during which CDS students will be honored with the coveted John Robinson Prize, the MG Kanbar Prize, and the Chandrika Sharma Prize. Without further ado, I welcome the distinguished chair, uh, Dr. Thomas Isaac, and uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Hasib Drabu, and all participants uh, for attending the 12th Foundation Day lecture. and. Uh, uh, we will now start the <laughs> award ceremony first, and after that, the uh, the, the lecture. Yeah. Make Thank you, sir. Next, we have the prestigious prize announcements of the year 2000 to 2022-23. Various prizes have been awarded for the academic accomplishments to the following students. As the students are out of the campus, they have joined us online, listing out the names of the same. Mr. Rohit Kumar Sa bags the Joanne Robinson Prize, which is awarded for the best overall performance in the ME program 2021-2023. If you can show the certificate. Sir, we would zoom in the camera. It will be focused. Congratulations. Again, Mr. Rohit Kumar Sa backs the MG Kanbur Prize, which is awarded to the best performer in the quantitative course of ME program 2021-2023. Coming to the PhD students. Ms. Jayalakshmi T.A. backs the Chandrika Sharma Endowment Prize for the best statistical survey report submitted as part of PhD program 2022. Also, we have an upcoming prize announcement for the next year. Ms. Anusmita Das and Ms. Rini Raju of MA 2022-2024 batch will jointly share the MG Kanbur Prize for the best performance in the quantitative course of MA program. Prizes will be distributed in the next foundation day. But if the students are here, 
Okay, congratulations. Thank you. Now the chair may kindly take over the proceedings. It's great to be back with Hazib after such a long time. We had been together in the GST Council and we had a lot of fun also. A lot of fun. <laughs> it's a fact, uh, apart from Marvin Subramanian, the economic advisor, you are the only two professionally trained economists there. And therefore, we could give a flavor, different flavor to the whole debate and discussions taking place. And now, I don't know what my brother is going to say. I used to call you brother and you used to call me back brother. So, <laughs> a lot of people used to be very amused to why we are calling each other brothers. <laughs> anyway, that was the way we used to address each other. I don't know what exactly you are going to structure your presentation. I don't want to enter into it. But the theme of discussion today is very, very important, particularly because, one, there is a lot of discussion going on federalism. There are a lot of people who genuinely feel that federalism in India is under threat. Now, I think, therefore, it is very important to think about what a new federal compact could be. I, for one, would argue for following the principle of subsidiarity that every state and region should have certain autonomy in development, which would mean they should have sufficient resources for pursuing such autonomous power. And now the significance of this context in which this presentation is being made is the 16th Finance Commission is going to be appointed any time. I, for one, believe that we have been saved by COVID from the 15th Finance Commission. The COVID was the um, least appropriate time to do any kind of uh, tightening the purses uh, reducing the borrowing uh, ceiling from 3% to 1.75%, which was what was being contemplated and so on. Uh, instead, you have a finance commission that took a um, relatively uh, say, um, broader view of things. They retained, yeah, they retained the revenue deficit grant and so on. So I'm certain in the presentation, you would be also referring to the system finance commission coming up and i will reserve the comments yes. after your presentation please mike is yours thank you thank you very much uh, dr isaac um since uh, isaac started off with uh, the gst council we were very famously called the kk gang the kashmir kerala gang we changed the order of sitting also to be together but um, what I find most fascinating is that uh, when GST was launched by Arun Jaitley in the Central Hall of Parliament in 2017, it was a big event. It was mapped as the second uh, Freedom at Midnight. And the Prime Minister was there. The President of India was there. It was a big ceremony. I don't know if you were there, but I had attended. So uh, Arun Jaitley uh, referred in his, he was a very gracious man, a very fine human being. He referred in his uh, inaugural address and said that, you know, I owe a debt of gratitude to three uh, state finance ministers, two of which are sitting here. So, so two out of the three were uh, are alumni of CDS, and I think that's something to to kind of, you know, be, be, be proud about. And uh, but my contribution, I can tell you, without any degree of modesty, was much greater than Isaac's. The reason, because I'll tell you what my contribution was. I was the official translator for the finance minister of Kerala. He could not I understand a word of Hindi. And you had all these finance ministers from all the states like UP, MP, Rajasthan, Punjab, speaking in Hindi. And here was Isaac looking completely lost. <laughs> so he was, what are they saying? What are they saying? So I take credit for 
the fact that I was the official translator for the finance minister of Kerala, and that is my contribution to the GST Council. <laughs> I'm very, very glad to be here, to be very honest with you. It's been, I'm very grateful to Professor uh, Viramani to invite me. I am not an academic. You can at best call, call me a para, paramedic in terms of that I do some policy making. I've done some policy making. I have an academic background, but uh, I'm very glad to come here. I was really comforted by the fact that CDS hasn't changed. It still looks the same. The only big difference and disappointment for me personally is that the hostel that I lived in has now become a girl hostel. So I wanted to visit my room. I don't know who is living there, but uh, I came to CDS when I don't think 99% uh, of you wouldn't have been born probably. Uh, I came to CDS exactly 40 years back. It was September 3rd, 1983. And that was a transitional phase, a phase in my life that, you know, I have gone through a hugely eclectic career. I have been in the Planning Commission, in the Finance Commission, in the Prime Minister's Advisory Council. I've done banking. I have run a state. In all that, CDS has really stood me in good stead. Whether I was in banking, I did not know my knee from my elbow when I became chairman of a bank. I had never done economic policy planning when I became finance, you know, advisor to the government of GNK way back in 95. In whatever I did, CDS was very, very important because it taught me a certain degree of innovativeness in thinking, a certain method of thinking. I think that's what, what really has been a contribution. I was very uh, distressed to hear that the MPhil in Applied Economics has been abolished. It was a wonderful course, wonderfully curated by some of the legends of economic policy making in India, starting from Professor Raj, who I had the good fortune of knowing. And uh, you know, before I get to uh, the lecture, I remember I came in and uh, K. N. Raj had written a working paper. Those days we used to have those cyclo style working papers here, and it was about the uh, capital output ratios. And I, I had just come in, this was probably around December, and I uh, saw the paper, I saw some errors in it. And I walked up to Vaidyanathan and said, There are errors in this. And Raj reached out to me, and that's when the first time I met him, and he acknowledged it in a when he published it that, you know, there were a few errors which were pointed out by a student here. So that was the kind of democratic culture that uh, CDS had. And I'm glad it has stayed that way. At least the look and feel is the same. Um, today, uh, what I intend to do, can I just get this on the thing? I won't. How do I get this on the screen? Can this? Just... No. Yeah. Ah, okay. So. Basically, uh, this is what I will talk about fiscal federalism in an open regulated economy towards a new federal compact. The idea basically being we've been all talking about federalism and uh, what needs to be done, but it gets restricted. So I'll take you through a set of stuff very quickly. I won't take, I'll take 45 minutes at best. The basic premise of the lecture is very, very simple that, that since the time we started a federal structure in 47, Everything that I can think of has changed. The nature of economic regime has changed from socialism to business liberalism. The framework for governance has been modified from two tier to three tier, where you and we brought in the Panchayati Raj thing. The institutional landscape for policy making, whether it is the planning commission, the way you negotiated state plans, the way things were done, all has been changed. The structure of public finance has changed. You no longer are looking at plan versus non plan, you're looking at revenue and capital. And then, of course, in 2017, the entire index indirect tax regime was completely altered. Now, when you see such major changes that have happened over the course of the last 70 years, one thing has not changed, and that is the framework of fiscal federalism. It continues to be exactly what it was in 1947. In fact, one of the things I'll talk about is what we had in 47 was actually designed, conceptualized, operationalized by the British and Government of India Act 1935. So the premise of the lecture is, despite everything having changed, the framework has not, the framework of federalism has not changed. And that is primarily the reason for re-looking at all this. And I'm not really here talking about the politics of it. There'll be some references to it in the politics. I'm just looking at from a perspective of the fiscal dimension of federalism, 
fiscal being a subset of the larger issue of federalism as a form of organization of the economy, of the government, of politics, and stuff like that. Now, these are the four things I talk about. The construct of Indian federal framework. How was it constructed? How did we arrive at the framework that we have today? Second, if we are going to make a change, what is the context of that change? Third, what are the contours of that change? What should it encompass? And finally, the conclusion part. And the conclusion is when I will kind of pull together various threads uh, and arrive at 16 Finance Commission saying that because we have these many changes, can we now put our minds to something that we can do? That's something that I've picked up from policy making in CDS. We were still looking when I was in 83, whether in 1968 there was a crisis or not. And I'm sure that happens even now. So there's a certain contemporary to it that can we, whatever we have discussed, can we look at and see if there's a focus to it? By December this year, hopefully a finance commission will be set up. Can we provide some input to it through public domain? Now, there are five themes and threads that I have observed as we go along. First is that federalism in it was a political compulsion. It was not an ideological choice. Democracy was an ideological choice. Socialism was an uh, ideological choice. Republicanism was an ideological choice. Federalism never figured as a, as a choice that I want to be federal. No. And I'll explain that. Second is that the form that federalism took was very colonial. And it was not suited for democratic republic. Whatever we have today has been drawn from what the British had done. So there is no innovativeness in that. The third part was that when we, as federalism evolved in India, it evolved for a certain type of an economy. What was that economy? Very closed economy, very command-driven economy, with qualitative controls, with fiscal controls, with tax regime, all kinds of stuff. 91, we changed everything to an open economy. So there was a difference between of how should federalism operate in a closed economy? Then if you have an open economy, what should be done for it? Fourth issue, that there was administrative decentralization. And this is something that I'm sure, speaking in Kerala, there'll be a lot of debate on this with Isaac sitting here, is that the entire Panchayati Raj system, the way it is panning out, to my mind, is centralization to decentralization. The way it is now states are being subverted and the center is going directly to panchayats is a huge issue of concern for federalism. And finally, the trend that I have observed is in the six decades of India as an independent country, political units have become smaller and economic spaces have become larger. So you have a common economic market today and you started off, and I'll come to that a little later, of how many states did we have when we started off in 47, and how many do we have now? Does it reflect something about the nature of the Indian state? So those are the broad themes that I want to cover in the course of these uh, 45 minutes. To my mind, India federal system is a consequence of partition. If you go back, and this is something that the most radical federalists in India will not even think of today. On January 22nd, 1947, in the Constituent Assembly, Jawaharlal Nehru proposes a resolution which was very famously called Objectives Resolution, which resolved, it was passed by the Constituent Assembly, that Indian states will have the status of autonomous units. No central control. All states will have residuary powers. Residuary powers meaning that if I run into a conflict with the center, my will prevails. The only state that had residuary powers to recently was JNK. No other state had. But in 1947, it was approved by the Constituent Assembly that we will have states who will be autonomous, who will have residuary powers, and most importantly, they will have control over all government functions except three, defense, foreign affairs, and communication. The rest, everything was given to states. And this system, this resolution stayed till 3rd of June, 1947. What happens on 3rd of June? 
3rd of June, the cabinet mission plan fails and partition is announced. The day partition is announced, Indian National Congress changes its perception, saying no, now we cannot have this form. We have to have a centralized thing. The reason when you go back to it is Muslim League was very keen to look at a federal structure. And because National Congress wanted to avoid partition, it was given as a bait to the Muslim League saying, if you join India or if India stays together, then you will have autonomy. The day that collapsed, Indian federalism was born. And that's the story where it starts. So it was not a choice. It was a compulsion. The what we had now what happens is so once it's decided that india will be now one big central federation or whatever it is you are unifying and go back to 47 you are unifying administrative territories princely states linguistic regions social things it's a huge disparate uh, subcontinent with huge cultural heterogeneity and stuff like that it was impossible to govern from the centers so natural consequence was you will have a two-layered governance. You will have central governments and you will have provincial governments, the state governments. So the thing of doing a two-state was more like a palliative, an institutional mechanism of saying that you join the new federation, we'll maintain some regional autonomy, and we'll also help you do the thing. That's how the Indian federalism as a governance system operates. When you have this decision being taken, that you will run the administration on two lines, federalism comes in handy and says, okay, now that we have these two layers, federalism becomes a subset of a parliamentary democracy, which is two tiered. So it's a consequence. It's not a, it's in fact a compulsion and it's not a choice that I definitely want it to be, which is why we have the kind of a fiscal system that we have today. But now remember, this happens on 3rd of June. There are only two months left for partition, uh, to, for partition to get done. At that point, nobody thinks creatively. We all talk about great things about B.R. Ambedkar and constitutional makers and all that. Short of being disrespectful, Constitution plagiarizes Government of India Act 1935 word for word. You go back to the Geo Act, look at the Constitution, Every single word is lifted and planted because you didn't have time to think creatively. Consequences, what was Government of India Act about? It was about a colonial power trying to dominate the states. Very simple. When you take that element into it and make it the foundation piece of federalism, the DNA remains the same. The center becomes something which is dominant and overpowering the states. Hence, the problem that Isaac talks about, that I talk about, but the fact is that it didn't happen over time. It happened the way you actually lifted uh, the uh, GO Act. In fact, even prior to that, there was an arrangement between the British and the provinces for revenue sharing, which was the part of the Montego Shamsford reforms in 1919. The devolution formula that gets adopted in 47 and continues till date with some tweaking here and some tweaking there draws from the government of india act 1919 there's a guy called umshot who wrote it including which isaac mentioned deficit grants these also come from the british in a, in terms of the uh, design the only change and this is the most important part the only which tells you about the mindset of the nation builders. The only word that is changed in the Government of India Act, the Government of India Act says India shall be a federation of states. The Constitution says India shall be a union of states. That is when the balance tilted. And you residuous whole and Ambedkar has written reams after reams on why. You become a union of states. 
So when you talk about India Union of States, you are really talking about a very amorphous entity which says Union in form and federal in spirit. That spirit talks about somewhere along the right side. So this is the broad construct of where uh, where federalism operates. In fact, the word federalism does not appear in the Constitution of India. It appears in one footnote, which says there will be a federal court of justice, which is the Supreme Court. Because Supreme Court did not have powers at that point in the in 50s on the states. High courts were the last. It was a court of appeal. That's the only time. Nowhere else does the Constitution mention the word federal, fiscal, political, nothing. Socialism comes in 1979 in the preamble and the political state policy. Secular comes in 1979. The word is still there. When you look at it, it may get eroded soon. That's a separate matter. But the word federal doesn't appear. So that gives you a sense that genuinely there was never an effort, nor a desire, nor an ideology position on making India a federal state. So then I ask lighthearted this question, then why are you fighting for it now? It was never there to start off with. Nothing has happened now. It always has been like that. Having said that, do we need to change it? Is there a certain compulsion, not ideological? I may be ideologically a federalist. Isaac may be ideologically a federalist. But is there a need from a pure public policy perspective in terms of uh, public policy in fiscal, in other parts, is there a need is there a context for the change? And I have a few thoughts on that. First is this thing about, if you look at it, 1947, we had large political administrative units, but small fragmented markets. Now in 70 years, one big trend, which I haven't seen being talked about, is that political units have become smaller and economic spaces have become larger. There were only six states in India when independence happened. 1956, first reorganization happens, it goes to 14. Today, you have 36 units. These are administrative political units. There are 28 states and eight UTs. But let's consider them as, so I'm looking at really a broader category of a sovereign and sub-sovereigns. So sub-sovereigns include both the states and the, and the union territories. Why did you make, and soon, this 36 will go to 40. You will have a breakup of, you know, within UP, you will create four states. You will create uh, another state in Orissa. You will create, maybe in Kerala also, why not and others can now become another state or a UT, it will be declared. So um, you will have, is there a reason as to why you are constantly trying to shrink the space, political space, political units to take it to 38 now. Yes, there were. At the same time, while you were doing this, reducing the number of, or increasing the number of states, reducing the political spaces, you are forever fighting this battle to increase economic markets. So if you look at Article 301 of the Constitution of India, it actually says we need to promote a common economic space. It's not today. This is 1947. Reduce barriers to entry, reduce trade barriers, reduce tariff barriers. So constantly the effort is, I want one economic unit. Now, if you go back to 47, what you're seeing is a very segmented market. So political integration happened in 47, 56, 58, and now 2019 with GNK. Fact remains that economic integration had never happened. So it was a prime driver of this, and that's the time when Mahalanobis becomes influential, Nehru is very socialist in his approach, and you have this centralized command economy structure that requires a common economic space. Two important implications of this. One is when you have big states, they can compete with the center. Today, UP is a state which has power. If I send 90 MPs to the parliament, I am a powerful state. I can negotiate. Andhra sends 87 MPs to uh, or X number. I remember a time in the political history of India when Chandrababu Naidu as Chief Minister of uh, Andhra was a big player in deciding who will become the Prime Minister of India. That's when Devgaoda becomes the Prime Minister of India. So what I'm saying is that bigger states have larger political clout. So what states lost was the political clout. But 
having said that, the interesting feature is in 1947, states together got 15% of the central revenues. Today they get 42%. But in lieu of this, while the states, because of coalition politics, because of various things, managed to increase the share of their taxes from 15% of, please remember this, you'll get a sense of perspective. 15%, if you see the original constitution, it had only two taxes to be shared. One of taxes was maybe shared by the constitution. Isaac will remember the debate we had on the GST Council on Compensation when the first draft of the center came, he said, center may compensate the states. And we fought this huge battle. They can't be may, it has to be shall be shared. Now, if you go back to Constitution 47, it says the center may share excise duty and shall share income tax. And total was 15%. Today, it is 42%. And the major breakthrough was made by the 10th Finance Commission. And I'm very happy that I was a part of the 10th Finance Commission that we pooled all taxes together and said, 29% should go to states and rest with center. That 29 has now gone to 42. It will eventually go to 50. This is notwithstanding the fact that states had lost a lot of clout in the structure. However, because of coalition politics, because you had these disparate groups and all that, you exercised control and got that. But while you were doing this, center got much more. They got control over the common economic market. Because when you have a common economic market, the trade between states, between Kerala and Kashmir, is not driven by what I and Isaac do. It is driven by what the center does. So once you have a common economic space, you actually take over the space of policy making in terms of uh, how the trade should be conducted, what rates we charge, which is why we had that central sales tax, which was a hugely regressive thing. I'll come to that separately of IGST and all that, but the implication of this major thing was that states lost a lot of clout because of being smaller and smaller and center gained because it gained economic space. And because that time you were looking at the socialist model of planning and stuff like that, it acquired a lot of space in terms of clout to do what it did. did, did. To the point that in 1991, when economic liberation took place, not a single state government was on voted. I am sure the state finance ministers who were then finance ministers would have read in the papers that this has been done. Such was the arrogance of the regime at that point, and the states were oblivious to this. So you saw that how center usurped the space because of this whole approach towards the common economic space. Second big change to my mind was that the entire federal structure was because of for a closed economy. You had a restricted thing, you were trade restricted, you were tariff restricted, you were not doing uh, exports, you were doing import. So that was a large part of the way you designed food. What did that mean? It really meant that the only thing to be distributed is government revenues. That's all there was, nothing else. And I remember there was a gentleman here who, uh, who got me interested in this many years back, a gentleman called K.K. George who, along with I.S. I. Gulati, wrote a wonderful paper on institutional flows that operate from banking side and how they distort the fiscal balance. They did it in 1986-87. Uh, that somebody, the new researcher, should update that because it's such a valuable piece of work. But the point being that once you move from an open economy to a closed economy, there are things I'll discuss those separately as to what happened. But the main part was central government was the driver of economic development in the city. There was nobody else. Public expenditure was about capital formation, about savings, about controls, about fiscal policy, financing investments. But then 1990 happens and you suddenly open up the economy. But something more happens. It is no coincidence that both things happen together. One, the world, India is open up to the world. Manmohan Singh starts off this 1991, and I happen to be a part of that whole, uh, I've seen it from very close quarters, um, about 91 devaluation. I used to work for an for a organization called Economic Advisory Council of the Prime Minister. Bimal Jalan was the chairman, 
and we drafted a, a package for devaluation of rupee. And the code word was, I can tell this 40 years later, hop, skip, and jump. So first was a hop, devaluation of 9%. Then there was a skip, give a day, don't do anything, and then take the jump of 13%. So devaluation was done in two phases. All of it happened in 91, and India opens up, and that's the story that we all know. Uh, opening up and the glory of economic reforms and whatever, no matter how you disagree with it, there has been change, remarkable stuff has happened. But this happens in 91. One year later, barely one year later, a Constitutional Amendment Act is brought in, which decentralizes the federal government. 73rd and 74th Amendment to the Constitution of India, which gives constitutional position to panchayats. To my mind, these two things destroyed whatever fabric there was of federalism. Why? From the top, center was pushing the states down, and from below, the panchayats were nibbling at their heels, you collapse the state system. That story will unfold further. Second, it's not that just because you dismantled controls and liberalized, that everything became open, center also lost control? No. What happened was controls and what was that time called the control and command economy with huge quantitative controls and all that. Rakesh Mohan did lots of work on that. It was replaced by regulations. So ministry is not deciding, but a regulator is deciding. Today, SEBI decides. Earlier, it was control of capital issues decides. Who is this regulator? What does he do? I'll come to that in the last section. Private investment suddenly came in. Public investment started dropping. There was a time KN Raj started this huge debate the savings rate of India, 30% saving rate and no corresponding public investment. We were operating at 28%. I see Mr. Shivananda nodding, remembering those glorious days and saying what happened. And today, where is public investment? Down to 3% of GDP? 90% happening through public investment? Now, if that is a major change, then should I look at the federal system at all? Decentralization is not about efficiency gains, that I will devolve to panchayats, I'll be efficient. That's what the line that Isaac would take. It is about how center is bypassing the states to devolve to panchayats directly. Then why am I there in the middle for? If you are going directly from the prime minister to the DC, where is the chief minister, where is the finance minister doing? What is he doing? I once said in a, in a seminar in Delhi that as finance minister of JNK, I am the 12th man in the cricket team, supplying water to those guys who are deciding on policy. That is why I take a very different view on GST council. I will come to that in a little bit. So when it is about the first tier, which is the UN sovereign, bypassing the second tier, legitimate, elected, not some random uh, guys, then it's a concern of how you are actually trying to do centralization through decentralization and you are trying to defederalize India. And that's something that we should look at. Then, of course, apart from these big trends, you also see planning commission was abolished. I was a, I'm no big fan of planning commission. I worked there for four years. It was an extra constitutional body doing nothing, but it was photo ops and all that with state finances doing whatever. But it was it was a forum where I could go and get my plans approved and stuff like that. It was a forum. It was abolished. It was replaced by Nitya. I don't know what Nitya does today. Uh, I have no idea. I mean, it lost its thing in the landscape. 14th Commission did a very good award where they said center actually does two things. It shares its revenues and it underwrites some expenditures through centrally sponsored schemes and whatever. So Reddy was an absolutely brilliant mind, one of the finest economic administrators I have come across and worked with, uh, Vinukopal Reddy. He was the chairman of the 14th Commission. He gave a brilliant award saying that the idea being that keep the amount same, but let everything go through revenue transfers, not expenditure writing. So it gave certain states a certain focus that I'm entitled to this revenue, not ad hocism, because CSS was hugely regressive. Reams and reams have been written on how UP would get 14% of CSS, Madhya Pradesh would get 9% of CSS, and Kerala would get 1% of CSS, that kind of stuff. So they moved there. That was a big award, which I thought. Then, to my mind, a big thing that happened in the 14th Commission was their 
supporting this, and I had a big argument with uh, Mr. Reddy that this was not something that you have done, is to get panchayats grants directly. Let them route through uh, SFCs of states. I have no problem, but not directly. Um, and uh, I, in fact, wrote a piece called uh, called uh, Junior MLA Senior Punch. Because now MLA has no role. Now, I was an MLA in JNK, and uh, there were 14 sub punches. Now, those who have become the main players, I have no way in the game. And so, they, you are distorting the representative character of Indian democracy. That aside. Third, uh, fourth important point was eventually you actually set up a GST council where I believe that there could be disagreements on this, that center and state shared their sovereignties. Center gave up its rights and states also gave up rights, but they got a voice on the table, which is why Isaac could speak about inflation impact of GST and get it modified. He could speak about lottery. He could speak about compensation. Earlier, there was no forum. So, if you have a good finance minister who could present a case, yes, it would be wonderful because we were also a part of a national decision making process. We may not have succeeded 100%, but what it did was to create an institution where center and state sat together, discussed, deliberated. And I remember that we actually were drafting the constitution as if on the fly. They would come with papers, we would all sit together, three days, four days, discussions would happen. And even I don't think the best GSC system, it can still be improved, but at least it made a difference. So that was the other context of change. Now that you have what I call India's first genuinely federal institution was the GST Council, where I was there and I could take uh, put my view onto it. A state like Manipur, we discussed it for 45 minutes about whether we should tax uh, dry fish or not. I normally some joint secretary in sitting in some ministry would have decided. But the whole point was how do you empower and how do you get a system? So those are the developments that provide the context for the change. I'll come to then what are the contours of change? Having said that, these are things, how do I outline what are the things that I look at? Okay, so first is my point that let's look beyond taxation. Revenue sharing. That is done. Federalism is about not, not about sharing taxes, but about sharing the power to raise taxes. Part of it is done through GST Council. But in the new economic system that we have, the key to economic growth in India, anywhere else in the world, is natural resources. And India is woefully short of natural resources, woefully short. The only difference today, in my opinion, between the China growth story and the India growth story is China has access to natural resources. In the 90s and 2000s, they went ahead and bought half of Africa. They own every single mineral today, which is what is fueling the growth. India is a hugely commodity deficit economy. We are the largest importers of coal. We are the largest importers of oil. We are the largest importers of gas. If that is the story, and I have resource rich states, be it in Orissa, be it in Northeast, be it in Kashmir, be it in Goa, what role does the state have in this? It's all run by the center. Do I have a play in the natural resources? At the end of the day, these are within my territory, my state, my administrative control, but I have no role over them. This dimension, about resources, natural resources, is completely absent from the federal debate, federal discourse. And a bit disappointing that the scholars, the academicians from who work in the area of federal finance don't even bother pointing this out. They are still stuck up, should I do equalization grant, not equalization grant? Should I have a revenue deficit grant or not a revenue deficit grant? Should I get 2% of uh, CES or 1% of CES? Boss, the game is much bigger here because the center has complete control over resources. What they don't have directly, they have through PSUs. So IOC is owned by them. Gale is owned by them. Sale is owned by them. Coal India is owned by them. They give dividends to the central government. What do I have? 2% royalty, which has not been changed in 40 years. 
So why am I not fighting a battle which says that let's increase the ambit of federalism to include resource federalism and move away from this transactional revenue to, re to actual revenues? That if Orissa has today access to coal, what is it doing? It's actually being very aggressive and being very protectionist, saying if you extract 100 tons of coal, 50 you have to deploy in Orissa. Why not monetize it and say that you, whatever resources there are, because center gets almost 80 to 90 percent of the revenues coming out of the Quite apart from the cesses that they levy, the biggest thing which has been remained outside the ambit of federal finance is the dividends that these companies give to government of India. Go and check out how much dividend uh, Coal India has given to government of India. Go and check out how much IOC has given. Assam gets nothing out of IOC, which is central government gets everything. And now that the game is different, now that the game is of divestment, where you want to divest, you are going to rake in hundreds and thousands of crores where the states have don't even look at, forget aspiring, forget working out a system. So my point is the resource federalism actually is something which is a significant part to play in the ongoing federalism, given the fact that resources will now drive the global economy. So there's a premium on natural resources. And if you don't see this premium and cash it, share it with the states, you will not be able to restore the balance of fiscal federalism in India. So that is one large part of thought there. So we need in uh, the federalism an institutional mechanism which goes beyond royalties of 1%, 2% to actually a share, be it in the dividends, be it in the uh, divestment, be it in the simple extraction. Otherwise, these resource rich states, which happen to be border states, whether it is Northeast, whether it is Eastern India in Orissa, whether it is Goa, these states are becoming extremely protectionist now. Goa has enacted a law of how much you can extract. So has Orissa. Assam has now started charging that if a fuel tanker leaves, I will levy 5%. What you will do is create a situation of having huge protectionism within India and a complete open economy to the rest of the world, which is an inverted globalization, which will actually kill the growth story of India and we'll all kind of suffer through that. So that is one large piece of, uh, of the story that I'm talking about. Second big elephant in the room. Monetary federalism. Monetary policy is completely dominated by the center. Now, RBI, both its architecture as well as who, who is appointed, who is the governor, who is the deputy governor, who, what is the MPC, everything is headed by the center. It has nothing to do with a constitutional country. And I have not seen anybody talk about monetary federalism, saying, well, what happened? Now, my point is, let us explore the plausibility of federalism, but most importantly, uh, my, my concern is, it was not important so far, till 1991. What was important when you are doing policy planning, the big instrument for policy intervention in the economy was fiscal policy, public investment, till 91. Post 91, monetary policy has become the most important one, whether it is interest rates, whether it's exchange rates, all that is now driving economic growth. If there was a change in uh, interest rates in 1974, I and Isaac and you would not even know about it because there was no link to it. Today, everyone has his housing loan, 25 basis points up, down, your life becomes difficult, right? So the entire intervention in household economy, public economies is not fiscal uh, intervention, but monetary intervention. Now, monetary intervention states have nothing. Where do they fit in? So is there a need? So one of the things that follows from what I said earlier, that in closed economies, you look at fiscal policy as a major instrument of intervention. In, uh, in uh, open economies, monetary policy becomes interventionist. So since you had given me fiscal policy shares earlier, that is irrelevant now. Now, can I have a piece of action of the monetary policy? 
Now, monetary policy it has huge differential impact in in uh, in across states. If interest rates is high, exchange rate changes. Kerala will get far more affected because of its remittance economy than I in J and K, which doesn't have that remittance economy. Similarly, you will talk about the level of economic development. Social spend in Kerala is much higher than in UP. So, if you do that, you will have a huge impact on the public expenditure policy of a state like Kerala vis-a-vis -vis a state like. So, the point being that you can't have a one shoe for all in monetary policy because not only are our public expenditure policies different, we have different development models, we have different sources of income. All that gets tied up to the variables that are driven by money supply, interest rates, exchange rates, whatever you have. And also, if you have large corporates, large houses like you have in Maharashtra, the impact is very different from then in Kerala, where you don't have such large houses. Wage indexation becomes very critical. Today, Isaac will be fighting a huge battle coming from the CPM, concerned about the working class. What happens to wage indexation in Kerala will be driven by something that is done in Bombay by the Reserve Bank of India. Now, how does one have even a say in this? There are four regional boards and so on and so forth. Can we activate them? But most importantly is, is the fact that between 47 and now, the states today are raising more money than center put together. The states have more debt than center has. The state's expenditure is far greater than that of center today. Also, that the institutions or uh, layers of government that issue debt is much more today. Today, a municipality also issues bonds. Today, a panchayat is also doing bonds. Now, you have three. When you started off, you had only one guy issuing debt. That was center. State was allowed by the center under Article 279 to issue debt. If I didn't want, states could not issue it. So it was allocated debt. You have liberalized that regime. Now I can raise my debt to whatever. There's still a clause uh, in the constitution that you cannot raise debt unless uh, in case you're in debt center. But I'm not getting into details. I can, we can do that as a part of discussion. Broad point being 47, only <coughs> the center raised debt. States raised debt subject to central approval. So you didn't have the debt instruments, you never debt market. And third, panchayat didn't exist. Now you have, so now you have three layers of debt. Who manages these and how? Will I still have to? So you have to change the debt dynamics of the states. And that has to be the critical part. State development loans today don't compete with center. They compete with corporates. So the macroeconomic implications of SDL, which is a state development loan, which are the contract what you borrow, are very, very different from that of the CGLs or the T-bills or the auction bills. So we have to build a system that actually provides for a monetary policy role for the states to bring in their issuance of debt, reissuance of debt. The biggest crisis that hit Indian economy is in 26, when the reissuance of uh, state bonds will come up. Now then, the center will have to build up uh, uh, so Isaac will have to be bailed out by center. Center may not be friendly. So they will not allow it. What happens to a state like Kerala, which is an opposition rule state? So when it comes to management of fiscal policy, it is imperative that I get a role in monetary policy to be able to handle the impacts of my fiscal policy because it's no longer driven by center. The center's role as an intermediary of debt in states has almost vanished now. They're doing very marginal stuff. If that is not so, then why should the entire control of debt raise? So the broad point out of monetary policy being that quite apart from everything else in terms of interest rates and stuff, if you want the states to have a robust debt market, get into infrastructure financing, banks can't lend state governments. I want to raise money for 14 years to do infrastructure financing. How will I raise it? There are no long-term development financial institutions. I have to access the bond market. If I access the bond market, I have to have an issuance. I have to have an attack. I have to have a credit history. I have to have a role. Who does all that for me? It's a bilateral arrangement. RBI only does uh, overdraft facility of uh, whatever it is. So where, and that's where 
Isaac, I remember, tried something to do debt issuance through a separate uh, structure and all that. But again, not possible because it's owned by the state. So if you want infrastructure financing, public expenditure policy to be changed, then you will need to change the dynamics of the debt market, build a sub-sovereign debt market with financial intermediation, with market makers, with investors, including foreign technology. Today, Maharashtra has more of foreign direct investment than all southern states put together. Today, Maharashtra has more FDI in private equity than 27 other states put together. Can there be a more aggressive system? So unless you allow a sub-sovereign debt market to be created, you could perhaps look at a federal RBI. Why should RBI be a central bank? It has to be a federal bank. US can, has tried that. You can even look at four federal banks. You can look at a southern federal bank, you look at a western federal bank, you look at an eastern federal bank, whatever. There are four courts today. They are providing no inputs into it. Different levels of development are important. So can we look at reconceptualizing the monetary policy architecture and bringing in the federal domain a role for states in federal policy through at least the issuance of debt. That's the second part of the story. Third is the regulatory part. Now, you have abolished the old control and command and replaced it with new laws. Look at any act, any activity, ranging for corporate to electricity to whatever, to telecom to environment, Everything is run by a regulator. Now the regulator, earlier I had a ministry. Now I have a regulator. That regulator is more centralized, more pervasive, more powerful. So you have a now and regulators, regulations are basically extended arm of center. SEBI. Who is chairman of SEBI? Center decides. Who are members? Center decides. Are they the regulator of uh, banking finance, banking, banking space? Who is the governor? They decide. Who is the, the finance secretary sits on the board of RBI. So the regulatory capture of this country by the center is phenomenal. I, in my opinion, the pervasiveness was never so large for ministries as it is for the regulators. States have no role. There's the environment law. Now, environment law is same for Environment Regulatory Authority of India. It applies to Kerala, it applies to Kashmir. Now, he has a different problem, I have a different problem. He doesn't have the same issue that I have. I have a forest cover issue. He doesn't have that. He has a swamp, whatever it is. We are made to comply. We have no role either in designing that or, you know, in implementation is left to you. You are basically being disbursing and drawing agents for the settling up. Any decision today on investment, any decision, I sit on a number of investment committees for corporates and uh, foreign funds. You require 20 approvals. All 20 are human regulators. Now, if I have to become a foreign investment liable state, then I must have some role in designing the regulations that I want. So all this is coming from an extended arm of center. The point being that there has to be some role. And here, what I am thinking of, I've been looking at this whole issue, that can we start using the regulatory part as lateral federalism versus vertical federalism. Today, we talk of federalism only in vertical terms, between center and states. What about across states? We could have tied up had we been closer geographically for a number of things. But can you look at creating these zones of a southern regulatory authority for environment, an eastern regulatory authority for mining and whatever, and bring in an element of understanding the local needs and the compulsions of what is to be done? And through that, you will kind of come to a an arrangement where center can become the arbitrator. I have no problem with it. I also believe in a center that is just and has a role. You can't leave uh, India to, you know, the women and fans of for despite 28 states. You need a framework. But all I'm saying is that within the regulatory framework, what space can be provided? And I have details of it. I'll leave back uh, a draft of this lecture uh, with with uh, money and see if any interesting. I can have a look at the detailed part of it. But broadly, I'm running out of time. I have another five minutes. I'll finish within that. Is that uh, how do I design a new regulatory architecture for India where states have a role to play 
both in terms of designing and implementation. So conclusion, all of this, then what do we do with it now? Primarily, uh, my point is that the 16th Commission is up for coming and it is driven by uh, what is called the terms of reference. The terms of reference is written by the Ministry of Finance. So they decide what they want to do. 15th Commission was terrible what they wrote in that. What happened to that? There used to be an economist called S. Gohan. He used to be from MITS. Well, remember S. Gohan. Gohan once said that the Finance Commission is a dog that barks at the center and bites the sticks. So that whole barking and biting is driven by what is written in the TOR, the Terms of Reference of the Commission. 15th Commission did not even recognize that today we have an indirect tax regime that is based on concurrency of indirect taxes, meaning today center and states have shared sovereignties. I levy taxes on the same goods that center levies. Center cannot announce today a rate change unless it goes to GST Council. This is what is the kitty that the Finance Commission devolves. They don't even look at it. They are still looking at 42% population, 22% this and so on. My point is first, the mandate of the Commission should be to examine that concurrency of taxes has changed the entire game. Earlier, it was a production based tax that I produced. The producer state got money. The paradigm has been completely overturned. It's a consumption based tax. So today, Kerala benefits because the consuming state, it imports. JNK is a consumption state. It benefits. Earlier, Maharashtra would benefit. So if that is indeed so, then do I need to change the entire horizontal and vertical distribution? Because my earlier setup was designed for a production-based system, whereby I said I need to give deficit grants to Isaac and to Hasib because they are consuming states, they don't produce much, therefore there's a gap and hence fill it. Now it's not so. So is there need to now look at more other things, efficiency, uh, structure of public expenditure, are you towards public goods, are you towards private goods, bring in an element of market federalism rate and how you're behaving. Now, earlier, in the origin-based taxes, you are exporting your burden to poorer states. Now you are actually doing the reverse. So my point being that the entire criteria of vertical, which is from center to states, and more importantly, horizontal, which is between Kerala and Kashmir, how do I distribute, has to be relooked in light of the closed economy, open economy, uh, GST, uh, fiscal policy, monetary policy. Is there a thing? So. How, what is visible pool now? I will need to, again, because what the Finance Commission devolves is decided by the GST Council. Should the GST Council be a part of the division or not? Because if I change rates tomorrow, it gets reflected here. So can I redefine the divisible pool? Today it is defined in a very union-centric manner. Second, can I look at the principles of vertical distribution? And third, can I look at the now, this is going to be possible only if the terms of reference of the Finance Commission are drafted properly. I remember in the 10th Commission, we also had uh, some very uniform terms of reference. But we worked out the thing, said, okay, you have given us these terms of reference. Here is my response to your terms of reference. I am recommending this. However, I am also proposing an alternative devolution scheme, which you may like to consider, and it was considered. And it led to a huge change of collapsing all revenues of center and giving one third to states, 29%. That dramatically altered the whole notion of federalism in India. Now, similarly, are you in a position to do that? Now, this also comes, and this is my last point I wanted to make to you. This also comes at a time, this Finance Commission comes at a time when there is stress in the system on federalism. This also comes at a time when the Delimitation Commission awards. So when you look back at it, 
the finance commission award becomes operative from 26 onwards and 26 is when the division happens so you have the award and you have the reward and <laughs> both combining together that is when a new federal system should either have been there or you might as well say goodbye to federalism in india thank you very much now before i open the to the discussion one point of difference yes. and uh, decentralization uh, and, yeah, <laughs> that is and uh, also a, another point of difference the tactics how do you go about it sure sure now the federal system for you is union and the states for me also the locality sure. There is a difference between 63rd and 64th constitutional amendment and 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment. I would like to have the relationship between the three tires on the principle of subsidiarity. It's well. Subsidiarity, all that can be best done at the local level should be devolved to locality. Only the residual should move up to the states and the residual to the center. That would be the ideal federal system, see. Now you're thinking of a ideal federal system, a new compact. You are keeping the locality out here. To me, that locality is important to make it a, a real democracy. A go beyond uh, representation, this MLS into direct uh, uh, participation. That's one. Second. I fully agree with you that we have got to look at, relook at one, uh, the monetary control, resource control, who controls them, and also the regulatory body is fine. That's good. But I was a little, in, and I was trying to figure out why do you just neglect uh, fiscal federalism? The simple reason is you have a situation in India where there is a regime that does not believe in diversity, which believes only in centralization of everything. So now you call for a new compact, trying to uh, get hold of uh, regulatory bodies, resources, and monetary policies, and so on. And in the process, will you end up in a situation where you lose even little fiscal space that you have? The states in India are in a defensive battle to protect something. So uh, that is not coming to your scheme of things. I think you should not respond to me now. No, no, no. And, and later, later. At the end, we are going to have a big fight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> to not particularly. Uh, devolution, uh, decentralization. I think we'll open up for discussion, can raise questions. And then uh, finally, we'll come to the points I raised. Yep, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for a great lecture. Uh, so, first, I just wanted to uh, point out a point of difference. Uh, this we need to discuss about monetary federalism, but uh, the fact that we are requiring to discuss about monetary federalism is because uh, in the neoliberal era, fiscal space has you know lost its relevance altogether. Uh, the reason fiscal space has lost its relevance altogether is because the state has now no role in driving the uh, development trajectory, driving the uh, trajectory of the uh, growth pattern of the country. Uh, in that case. The monetary space is the only way world governments as a whole, like in any government as a whole, is able to intervene. Uh, should, uh, and monetary space is not really a driver of development. It doesn't, you know, really uh, benefit the poorest of the poor. Like, I mean, to benefit the poorest of the poor and to, to uh, you know, uh, 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 ensure equitable distribution and uh, growth, uh, uh, you know, uh, sustainable growth, we need a stronger policy in, uh, fiscal intervention where we need, you know, uh, states and center to, uh, you know, take part in the process of development. But uh, aren't we ignoring this uh, fact and then, you know, uh, asking for uh, monetary, federalism, monetary federalism, we are just going to the EU 
crisis like the eu crisis is often discussed in terms of uh, whether the eu bank is uh, eu central bank is able to uh, accommodate all the countries or not but that that is not the question here whether the uh, the new liberal regime is able yes to... so that I, I think that's right that's what pretty much what i was pointing out i was one uh, any other any other questions yeah Sir, my question is that you mentioned in the presentation, even though the Finance Commission grants for states have raised to 42 percentage, on the other hand, the Planning Commission is being replaced. So the center's support to state plans have also gone. There is a loss of about 1,34,000 crores on that account. Even though there is an increase of 1,60,000 crores, you have, we, we have lost, the states have lost. And also, my other, que other question is that, as on the basis of FRBM Act, the states can only borrow up to three or three point five percentage, whatever may be. But uh, the finance commission, the subsequent finance commission is going to be coming. So it has to be considered considering a fact. No, that is when a state collects a rupee of tax, that state should at least get back a rupee back. But Karnataka, for the every one rupee tax collected by Karnataka, they are only getting back forty seven paise. So what's your view about that? Whether the finance commission should follow a policy to ensure states are getting a rupee back. Yes. Thank you, sir. They should get rupees back. What is the problem? The issue is different, I'll tell you. Yeah. Um, I've combined, since I'm going to respond to this, one point which Isaac is raising and is getting echoed by uh, the gentleman there, is that you're talking about monetary policy because that's relevant today. Fiscal policy is irrelevant today. Actually, correct. My contention is not ignore fiscal. I'm saying fiscal will go to 50% eventually. That is the logic of politics. How did it go from 15% to 42%? How? You have to see that. Don't look at only the other part of it. See it from a reverse perspective. States were reconciled to getting 15% of the total tax revenues. Has the responsibility of states changed? Nothing has changed. Has the congenital imbalance in the vertical imbalance changed? Not changed. You know you have not been allocated any fresh responsibility to the state government. You are living with 15% of the tax revision. Today you are getting 42%. I was a part of 10th commission. We decided 29%. And I asked KC Pand, I said, sir, 33 kar lete hai. Let us do 33. He said it will go to 50. Slowly and steadily. The more, what is the issue? It's about how the regional capital, your businesses, will compete for that resources, how your regional parties become powerful, then they will kind of raise it. So I'm not saying either fiscal or monetary. I'm saying fiscal, you already have a foot in the door. In fact, you have a leg in the door. Now an arm and a leg in the door at 42%. What is, uh, when you're getting back from GST, every rupee collected by center. So I levy GST, I keep the entire money. What center levies, I get 42% of that, right? Center has to also run its own uh, defense, foreign affairs, communications, whatever it has to run. The issue was two things were happening. Center was sharing revenues and was underwriting expenditures through CSS. The devolution total number has remained at 61%. If you combine devolution plus expenditure, it has remained at 61%. Center reneged on the contract, I agree, but not through uh, Planning Commission. Planning Commission was doing no funding at all. It was doing a thing called BCR funding, or balance of current revenues. When the balance of current revenues was passed totally and notional revenues were passed, center was not, it was not giving any budget support. It was, in fact, approving and allocating borrowings, which led to a lot of debt buildup in the states. So I am quite glad that the states can decide what they want to do at their plan and be done with it. Abolish revenue and uh, plan and non-plan. So there has been no loss. If you see today also, the total flows from center to states is 61 percent including expenditure and saying and that has remained at that maybe 0 0.1 percent up and down so it's not uh, the issue there that they have lost monetary policy i'm saying is you need to get a foot in the door you already have this that can't be changed because now you have a constitutional amendment which has been done post gst that you will share 42 percent plus of course because of people like isaac you got compensation also i personally uh, i remember isaac fighting with me that time also that compensation for what? What was the incentive for a state finance minister 
to raise revenues because I was guaranteed competition 14 percent. So if you look at the competition flows also, there's a far better status that you have today than you had in the pre-GST regime. And I am not the one who says loss of autonomy. States got a lot of fiscal autonomy by coming to the GST council and getting their things done the way they did. You uh, up till until the only dissonance was when the COVID thing happened and you had to borrow outside it. As regards three percent of GST, that is what my whole point is. See that back. you are today doing a three percent of GST uh, SDP because you don't have an independent debt dynamics uh, in the system. Sub sovereign debt market doesn't exist. I should be able to raise seven percent as long as I'm credit worthy and I don't cause a sovereign rate risk. That's about it. The rest is up to you. So three percent is artificial. I think the question that he was raising. Let's start with this. Hello. Um, say okay. As you said, the ratio is to forty-two, but you look, reduce the CS. <laughs> Fine. But there is an important thing. Despite this fact that uh, the share of central taxes rose to forty-two percent. If you look at the trend in the pre-devolution gap and the post-devolution gap, it has been widening right from the 1950s onwards. Um, something like uh, pre-devolution gap of what center or states? States. Yes. You, you should look at the center. Post-devolution, pre-devolution. They are like this. But anyway, uh, I think uh, that's uh, it. Best, I think uh, slightly the point is. Just I, to, uh, I just I just put a footnote on what he was asking. Yes, sir. Uh, when you claim that the share of states increased from 29 percent to 42 percent as we move from 10 to say, 15, we should realize that the share of cess and surcharges, which is not shared with the states, was only 6.4 percent at that time. Last year, it was 23 yeah, percent. Because that is because because there was an element called compensation cess. I also saw this number. I was very shocked. Where is this coming from? The Com fact is, you're saying compensation. The compensation. No, no. The, 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 no, 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 no. The state the, is the entire tax on petrol was uh, road sales. No, no. The point and is, the point is very simple. You are very optimistic that uh, you know this increase from 29 to uh, 42, but one has to talk with a rather maybe a spoon of salt. I mean, not a glass of salt. Because even before the compensation cess was in, introduced, the share was increased from 6.4 to now it is fourfold increase last year. It is raised almost 15% by that. So I think that is something which one has to be, I don't know, it is not to belittle your argument, your argument no, no. is strong, but it's something, this tendency of centralization, oh, covertly or overtly, I'm, that is something which I'm one has to See, uh, in fact, no, in Kerala, we get to hear a lot of lectures on fiscal federalism because thanks to ISAC, uh, we get uh, many uh, senior scholars to discuss this issue. This issue. And uh, in fact, in today's lecture, you took a very different approach, very refreshing approach. And uh, you brought in uh, this monetary uh, federalism and regulatory federalism and other aspects. Those are mentioned generally, but in your lecture, instead of focusing on the usual stuff of uh, fiscal federalism, you brought in these uh, additional dimensions, uh, which are not generally discussed. But now, the idea of monetary federalism from your presentation itself is very important. But uh, my question is, what's the experience of other countries? Uh, because uh, in, in Kerala, when uh, Kerala government tried to tap the capital market through the KPI at all, we are uh, encountering all kinds of difficulty. And uh, the central government is not at all changing the ideal of 3% uh, of the uh, GDP as far as uh, borrowing is concerned. So how can state government or uh, local governments Stop the financial market. Uh, if uh, this kind of conditions are there, what's the experience of other countries uh, in the case in the in the case of monetary federalism? Because uh, when it when it comes to monetary uh, policy, there are certain uh, 
central aspect to it. It's related to inflation, it's related to exchange rate and all. So central government can always give the excuse that it is related to inflation, it's related to uh, exchange rate, foreign trade and all. So you cannot uh, evolve these powers beyond a point. No, so two, two um, things really. One is that what is the experience of other countries in um, monetary federalism? I don't think a term like monetary federalism in that sense, but you obviously have a good example in US, which does uh, practice federalism in monetary policy through different federal banks, and you run a whole series of them are running and laying down the foundations. That is unlikely to happen in India, given the nature of the regime today and even otherwise. Uh, but there is the, the core of the Indian unitary policy is that the center underwrites sub sovereign debt. First, it intermediated it, said, if, if you're tomorrow, I will give, give it to you through HUDCO, through IFCO, through whatever I will, which is what the Planning Commission did to the detriment of the development of the market. That was one part. Second is that then, because you're going to borrow, I will have an impact. So, which is why I was emphasizing that what you need to create is a sub-sovereign debt market because today you have two types of people. You have the states and the local bodies who are raising debt. The most lucrative debt for investors globally is municipal bonds because you are aware of the whole local thing and local thing gets it. Can I start looking at building a market for local debt? which is where I am beginning to believe that market federalism is far more efficient than government federalism. So rather than government handling it, can it just be an enabling of a sovereign, sub-sovereign? It's a great paradox in India that today corporates are better placed than states. Today corporates can raise foreign FCN or can I say do it? No, they can handle foreign exchange. I cannot do it. Why? Is a corporate less so? You will have a corporate debt crisis and you are happy to live with that. You are not happy to live with a sub debt crisis. Why? The point also being that while you have not, you don't have to intermediate on my behalf, you must have some control because you are sovereign and I am sub-sovereign. I realize that. So we give you that control. But allow us a flexibility of market, which means I must have a credit history. I must build a reputation. Today, any amount, there are no restrictions, as we say, nothing. Now today, Kerala, Karnataka is a good, efficient state. It is priced as heavily in the market as UP. What benefit does Karnataka get to manage this fiscal thing? Nothing. What uh, incentive? Now, there are funds globally which say that governments should be socially responsive. Kerala is a great model in social spendings. You will get raised debt from them at much better rates because you are into sustainability debt, right? So, how does that come in? That will only come in when you have a uh, kind of a sub-sovereign financial system. Plus, forget large parts of RBI changing. Can I at least get a risk mitigation department which actually takes my debt and says I will wrap it around? To answer the question, yes, there are sub-sovereign crises have happened in Argentina, they have happened everywhere else, but there the center was not intermediating debt. It was only a guarantor to debt. Here it is very simple. I find a very simple. I, in fact, I had a discussion with uh, that time with Arun Jaitley saying, "Boss, you have to give me money in devolution. If I raise debt, you earmark that devolution to somebody else and say this is my guarantee. You don't have to pay for it. I will pay for myself." Huh? So there has to be a model of trying to be a market maker and build the debt for this market. What Kerala tried was a very obvious thing. You set up a vehicle, SPV, and then raise through that. That doesn't take care of any complications. Who will you sell the debt to? Who is the borrower? Will I be able to trade that debt? Suppose I want to raise an SPV. It's stuck with me, whether I like it or not. But I should be able to trade that debt or reissue the debt, which is what will happen in 26. Which is why I was saying that this is a good time to talk about it because the debt is huge and it can cause the thing. Plus, do you realize the amount of debt states like Kerala will have on PPF and uh, GPF and all that? The pension funds things. It is humongous. Who is going to pay for the debt? Somewhere one has to create a market to create that debt. So, point being, fiscal, yes, it is power for course. I am 100% sure, given the fact that states play such an important role, regional capital versus national capital is important, policy making happens, we will raise this to 50%. I am not discussing that because that is what discussed. 
In fact, that's a disappointment I have with all the fiscal federal scholars, is they take still our equalization grant and all that, oh, ho gaya bhai, karo, let's go on, move on with life. Now you come to some parts, fiscal taken care of, not so important, but that is bread and butter. Now I'm looking for jam in the new context, because in the uh, old system, it's not going to work. Maximum money today is going to come from non-tax revenues. If you look at union budget today, the entire part B of the budget is over. Direct taxes you can't raise. Indirect taxes you have to do in GST council. What is left of the union? Nothing. So where is the butter coming from? It is coming from dividends, which is where the RBI capture happened. If you remember, why was Ujit Patel sacked? Because he refused to part the dividend of 50,000 crores. That is where the regulatory capture is happening. And I am blissfully ignorant of it, sitting in my own uh, you know, state, not seeing the larger picture. So that is where the monetary, it has to come from below. So to answer your question, not about center doing it, but we have to build those markets here, even locally, issue a, you know, maybe a KDB, which has limited qualified institutional borrowers. Over time, I will build a credit history, build a market, sub sovereign debt market, and then kind of take it up. It has to be a bottom up approach, which is why I'm saying it's important to have a element of lateral federalism than just vertical federalism. Thank you, Thank you, sir, for the discussion. So, you discussed about uh, monetary federalism and fiscal federalism. And both of them come, come under the broader framework of political federalism. You also hinted to your thought that there are increasing tendencies of centralization of power and erosion of political economy of states to some extent. But, so, my question is does it matter if states are becoming more fiscally autonomous under the new GSP Council? If the larger, in the larger political federal structure, they are losing their autonomy. I remember your uh, talk about uh, can't hear medical land reforms. In some other talk, you discuss how that we can't have, not have been able to carry out those medical land reforms if we did not have the autonomy. So that's just a case in point. Uh, so make this point that whether it matters whether they are fiscally autonomous in the larger federal structure, they are becoming less autonomous. Good question. I think you answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, so there are phases, right? There are phases. We have seen a phase of extreme uh, centralization under Indira Gandhi. Extreme. It's not the first time it's happened or the last time it will happen. States have to also fight their battle at different levels, right? So you are empowering. It's also, a, it's not only about politics, it's about businesses. Because businesses hugely influence uh, politics. Yes. India was an asymmetric federation till 2019. It had enclaves of huge federalism in Northeast and in Kashmir. Kashmir has been now done and dusted. So you are now looking at a more symmetric federation. Um, yes, there is a bigger trend towards centralization, not just in politics, but in choice. You are cutting out all forms of diversity, which itself is an element of the But these are phases. It will come back to its own norm. You can't take a view based on seven years of any experience. India is a vast country, big history, lots of changes have happened. You f don't forget emergency, you will still see certain hangovers of that. So broad point, yes, there is, but people will realize, people will react, states will rise up, Kerala is the last bastion, the day it falls, then we'll see what happens. But still it's hope right now that at least one state is not under that capture. Um, to answer your question, yes, there is an increasing kind of uh, thing of, we have to understand if you were to ask me about the talk today, we have to understand the mechanisms in which that centralization is happening. And that's what I try to point out, either through regulatory capture or through monetary oversight or through health. If we understand these, we'll fight that battle and push it back. It, it's not about centralization, it's not about one person deciding, okay, now I'm the boss. That's not how it operates. It operates through instrumentalities. And we have to first understand the instrumentalities of the action and then build up our case which is what politicians like Isaac would do, I'm not a politician, is how you navigate it, how you build that change, and fight that battle at that level. That's how it is, which is why I am very, very bullish about GST Council. It gave me a voice. I could be heard. We fought a battle. We got what we wanted, right? So that's how, uh, how it worked. So key point being that you have to understand what are the tendencies of it, which is where my major debate, and I made this point deliberately, because I also want to engage with the debate, uh, is centralization the way it is operating and that answers isaac's question since i didn't answer that i'm not against centralization 
I'm saying the way it is being used today is to disempower the states. You are doing everything to push the states out of policy action from the top and from below. All functions of financial concept. Today, uh, Isaac sounded more like a Gandhian. That you know, you have this whole ideal notion of village centric governance. Fact remains that 68,000 panchayats cannot fight a center. One state can. UP can stand up in revolt and say, I will not do this. Right? The central government was very worried when southern states were talking about this gaming thing that they will withdraw GST. I had conversations which were like, look, what do we do if uh, states don't pass these bills? States have a power. None of these panchayats have legislative powers. Now, that's a huge issue. Because today, a GST change has to be passed by state assemblies. Tomorrow, you'll get a system whereby it won't have to be passed because panchayats agree with it. Panchayats have no legislative powers. Do you understand? That is the key point. I am not against decentralization. That's why I said very specifically. For, it's not for efficiency gains. Yes, I completely agree with Isaac on the subsidiary argument that who delivers best should get it. But that is not why it's being done here. It is being done to subvert the second level of governance because that can withstand the pressure of the center. Panchayats can't. Where are the panchayats and where is the central government, right? So that is my whole point. I'm not against it. And that too, experiments in centralized decentralization in Kerala, outstanding in Kashmir, way better than uh, Kerala, even much before Kerala. We had a decentralization in 1937 when Kerala hadn't heard of it. We have never got our credit in Kashmir since you seem to be from Kashmir from the looks of it. We have done it uh, in 1931 and we, uh, our land was never recognized. But Kerala was seen as a big case of it. Our land reforms were into debt free. I mean, sense that they even you think about the debt markets, all debt was written off, non compensatory. Kerala never did that. But they go to your library, you will not find a single book on Kashmir because it was never seen as a part of the activity. So nevertheless, uh, the thing being that we have, we have our own decentralization experiments, we had a much better system. But the way that system is being subverted, I'm not talking about Kerala in general, I'm seeing other places as well, is a threat to the larger cause of credits. But that debate will go on. Not all debates will be settled here. Yeah. Okay, thank you for your valuable insights, sir. So I have two questions. First one is, do you think that our uh, dilution formula followed by our finance commission is effective? whether our state is uh, getting enough advantages. And state second, meaning Kashmir or Kerala? <laughs> Both, sir. <laughs> and second thing is that uh, central government is restricting states to uh, not borrow much, but they are borrowing much. So don't you think that there must be a committee to monitor their financial affairs? What is your opinion about that? To some extent, RBI does that, and there has been talk about a loans council akin to a GST council. But honestly, I don't think we should we should be getting into that uh, as an institutional mechanism. Um, but on devolution, I mean, I would imagine that consumption states will do much much better, provided the criteria are recalibrated towards it, and which I think is the biggest battle that people like Isaac will have to fight with the uh, finance commission to get the get the devolution criteria changed to suit uh, the individual carbon states when devolution for parameters are made, and I have been a part of that exercise in 93, 94, it is very, very difficult to equalize all states. Impossible. It's such a diverse country. Impossible. Which is where some element will have to come in as grant, equalizing grants. How you want to do it is separate, but what criteria you may use is different, but you cannot escape from the fact that that element will remain. Piramani. Thank you uh, very much for a very thought provoking and uh, new perspective on fiscal federalism. So, um, so basically the argument, the broader framework that you are presenting here is that the country has moved away from the closed economy to a more open and market based economy and the fiscal federal architecture has remained in the earlier one. So there is a need for a change. Now I'm thinking about what is the model? that we can visualize in this uh, primarily a market-driven open economy for fiscal federalism kind of thing. So based on the argument and the questions raised here, what comes to my mind is what we have in mind is a kind of market preserving federalism as a model uh, that can accommodate the concerns. Like for example, uh, no, basically the idea here is that 
central government has too much arbitrary power uh, in decision making. So we have to take that out, that arbitrariness that they exercise, which put the state governments in a dis at a disadvantage. And that is what precisely a market preserving federal structure is trying to do. Uh, it uh, limits the arbitrariness uh, uh, both at uh, the central as well as the state, and at the same time, there is a competition for scarce. That also address the problem of uh, you know the resource rich states uh, not in a position to you know uh, capitalize on their assets. So, uh, so what I'm thinking is that isn't that a kind of uh, overarching framework in which we can think about a new structure? Yeah, pretty much directionally, what you're saying is right. One has to move away from governmental supranational federalism towards a more market-oriented federalism. Now, markets, you'll have to figure out that there is a public expenditure market, let's say. that What was CSS for? It was basically to create a common economic space and equalize services and whatever. I would go towards the market-oriented uh, federal structure than a government-driven federal structure. Of course, you can't wish away the government driven thing. But if you see today, the high degree of market inefficiency, uh, efficiency operates only in two things, Indian films and Indian mafia. Nowhere else is operate because it is pure market driven. If my gunman has to be, he has to be efficient. Either he kills or he gets killed. Now, when you bring in an element of market into that, you will bring in discipline, like what Haridhar was talking about, that you will have to first get to the market rather than driven the thing. So I would, yes, tend towards a more market-oriented okay. federal thing, which oh, okay. sits atop the government federal. Oh, let's see. My complaint, it's my the thing has been, with fiscal scholars has been, that you are stuck with that one thing that I have to get. Said. Now, how much will you get? You have 42 trade. If I become chairman of finance commission tomorrow, 50. What else? After that, what do you do? Where is money going to come from? Somewhere the economy is growing in a different way. You are not capturing that growth. You are still stuck in the past trying to revive at that. Keep that 50. By all means, make it 55. But it can't be where you milk the cow to the point that the cow itself dies. Center has to do preservative things. Right? It has to do finance for its, if nothing else, defense, foreign affairs, communication. Right? So it will have to have some amount. There are limits to which fiscal federalism can take you. Break that, move out of it and see what are the source of growth. Today, there is no correlation. If you, if a scholar here looks at the correlation of increase in shared taxes with GDP growth and source of growth, you will find no correlation. I'm saying get into a system that enables a correlation so that there's a normal buoyancy to my revenue, to my transfers. Gida is on That's one. Sorry? Gida. Gida is on Oh, I said, oh, 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 Question for you, question for you about the solution, about the solution, you want to call it a solution, you'll say it's a solution, you'll say it's a solution, but the direction but that the direction saying, that you're policy saying needs to go, policy which needs is, to go, which somehow is, states, somehow need, to be states given, need to be given a bigger, a bigger share of control. Share of control. Over monetary, over policy. monetary policy. Can you spell out? Can you what spell that out? Might look what? like that might look like. Yeah, sure. sure. Uh, some part of it actually has been done in the in the paper I've mentioned, but broadly, I'm trying to approach it from the issue of debt. That today you have a situation where states cumulatively. Issue, defray, service, more debt than the center. 
and center, which was first intermediating it, then second controlling it, is, not, is now over. What will allow me to create a debt market, a sub-sovereign debt market, which actually facilitates my public expenditure structure? So if I want to fi finance infrastructure, how do I do it through the debt market, principally the bond market? Today, you have a very well-developed market for the central government, senior securities. You have a fledgling market in corporate bond markets. You don't have an SDR market. Now, it is a market restricted to banks, which are all nationalized banks, which is whether it's a union bank or SBI or central banks, or you have institutions like the LIC and others who are buying the debt. How about creating a market for that debt that will give you one sliver of the monetary policy? Having said that, then you could look at some more elements as you go along to the market to get states more involved in inflation targeting, for instance, because you don't have the same set of uh, inflation impacting states in the same way, or for that matter, interest rates, or that matter, exchange rates. Can I then divide these four uh, regional boards to become more policy oriented rather than administrative boards for the Reserve Bank? which then funnels in its inputs for a variety of things that they see on ground, on their states, into a larger piece that goes into the central bank. So I would then see a eastern board, which is existent since 1950s, or a western board or southern board. I would see that southern board be much more sensitive towards the exchange rate management, whereas the northern board be far more sensitive to inflation targeting. Somewhere you'll get something that's go away from a one shoe fits all kind of monetary policy. So that's the thin end of the wedge. Now, as you go along, then you could see how other parts of federal federalism, whether it's regulatory or otherwise, pan out, then you could give greater space to it depending on the uh, credit worthiness of individual states and their clouds in the system. So I have spelled it out in fair detail for debt markets in the paper. I have mailed it to you and then I have a look at it. But broadly, this is the this is the kind of stuff that I think about. Okay, I mean that sounds interesting. Oh, yeah, that sounds interesting. I look forward, to, interesting. Seeing I look the forward paper. to seeing the paper. Yeah. But let's take a slightly let's take a slightly tack different tack on what you're saying. On what you're saying. I could look at I your could basic look at your basic as, argument as saying this. Saying this. If India was a small, India country, was a small country, okay, no states, okay, no, the no states, no the unitary, that unitary government, that would, unitary run government would run both fiscal and monetary policy. And in today's, in global, today's economy, global economy, it would essentially it would be essentially a be a deal. Pretty much complete mercy. Much complete mercy of, of the global, global financial system. Financial system. Correct? Correct? Yes. That's the reason why that's the reason at why the height of, at the height of pandemic. Pandemic. When everybody is talking, when everybody out is one talking out of mouth, one side of their mouths about the need for greater need expenditure, for greater on, expenditure health. on health and health system, the health system you have over a hundred countries, hundred countries implementing IMF implementing austerity. IMF austerity. Now you could now, argue. You could argue. And in a sense, that's what in I, a sense, take, that's what I take one and one, one aspect, of, one what aspect saying, of what you're saying. That because India because is a large country, India is a large country with with these sub these sub pub divisions. Divisions. Um, we won't worry about um, what we won't worry about what kind of federalism it is. There is actually, there is actually a functioning sector that the states that provide. The states provide 
against a one-size global monetary policy. monetary policy. Actually, global we monetary and global monetary and policy. policy. Is there a risk? Is there a risk? I mean, right now, I mean, it's right a now, very it's sort of very sort of. Um, um, you could say an unsatisfactory, unsatisfactory system because everybody's everybody fighting. fighting. But at another level, maybe but that fighting is maybe that fighting is good. Because exactly because as you said, exactly, exactly as you said, point about the, your point about the the child's is the child's is but, but the states are the states actually are spending. actually spending and screaming and screaming on development expenditure on development expenditure. Is it possible? Is it possible? As you drag them as even you more, drag them even more into into um, sort of um, um, one sort of uh, one size. Would we be getting would away we be getting from away from a one size one size monetary policy at the national, national level to make them to make of the one size fits all size global monetary policy? Monetary is that policy. a risk? Is that a risk? What you're saying? What you're saying? I'm not so sure to the extent that the no. national monetary policy is so aligned with the global one and then you see such a sharp transmission of that from the state to the union uh, to the global part. I would still feel that there is a bit of a disengagement between the uh, between the uh, global and the national monetary policy. Sure. But I'm not because even Because we are big. Because we are big. Because we are big. Yeah. So we sure. can get away, no, with I see, it. I see. get away with it. Yeah, sure. No, I, I see the point you're making, but what uh, the limited point that I was trying to do here is that can we start with at least recognizing that federalism has to look beyond the fisc and because the newer areas that are growing and contributing and having an impact on lives and social welfare and everything else is not fisc but is monetary. And that can't be just left to... Uh, and we have seen how the central government has done complete regulatory capture of the Reserve Bank in the case not so long ago through the MPC and whatever else. Are you happier that this is done by two joint secretaries, one of them who now written a book on Subhash Chandra Garg on this policy and uh, not 20 other states who will have some recent view on it? So today, I I'm also saying this partly from what happened in pandemic, where the RBI was completely absent from the picture, doing absolutely nothing. And then also the way the center has now shown complete disregard for corporate governance that the RBI breaches the banks in the way it is being run. And today you have a situation I was reading while I was on the flight here that a former, you know, uh, uh, deputy governor of Reserve Bank is actually sitting on the board of an entity who was regulating six months back. You know, so you have those kinds of anomalies that are distorting monetary policy in a big way, right from very instrumentalistic perspective to a far more structural perspective. So it's from that thing that I was coming and saying, but again, I'll, I'll send you the thing, have a look at it, then perhaps we could, you know, take this thing a little forward, that there are risks, yes, of how you kind of will align with the monetary policy. Today, there is some cushioning happening because the transmission is not so driven down the line. I, I see that point. I would just add one, just add one, one additional thing. One additional thing. I'm not making any predictions. I'm not making any not predictions. Saying anything about, anything. Saying anything about anything. Political. Yeah. Political. Yeah. But we are in an election but year. We are in an election year. And certainly and already, in, certainly Karnataka. already in Karnataka. The results of the election are showing the election up are showing up very much the the Now we know now that we know that promises, are being, promises made. are being made. And I think part and of I think what part you are saying, saying you are saying 
is pointing is to pointing the much, to greater, the much challenge. greater challenge that might come about, that might come about because of whatever cause may, happen may, happen may happen in this election. In this election, yeah. yeah. And I think yeah. that's yeah. a very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. I mean, the point. first thing Karnataka found was that not buy rice, not buy rice on the open market. In open market. Um, so, um, so, so that, so that was, suppose, suppose. There was a regime change. There was a regime change. And you get a new you government, get a which government is heavily committed, heavily committed to far more, far more by way of by way expenditures. Of expenditures. I don't yeah, know so how I don't know how much you heard of your um, um, you know what you were speaking about. What you were speaking about. The friends the of friends, friends Tony of capitalism, Tony capitalism. How much there is? How much give there is? How much give there is? Tony capitalism that can be shifted to these expenditures. These I think expenditures. These I think these probably problems. That's what you're saying, as well. What you're saying as well. may become may far become, become far more acute. Except that I'm, I'm not uh, as optimistic as you of either a regime change or a regime change that is no, desirable. No, I'm not optimistic. No, I'm just saying what I'm is. I'm just saying what is. <laughs> no, I'm, or except that one of my experiences has been that no matter who is in the center, he becomes a centrist. So there is very little <laughs> regard for centrism at any point of time. So that is that is my biggest. Uh, and the worst is that the way the bureaucracy behaves. The guy is in center. He's a big centrist. And when he comes to states, he thinks you know the federalism is the only answer. So there has been some degree of uh, you know the way it's kind of panned out, uh, which is why again, honestly, I I think one of the best things, though many people, including Isaac, would not agree with this whole GST council as an institution of federalism in India, how it could have been leveraged far better to do certain things, and perhaps we should take forward that experiment because the only way you can actually control a political government is to build institutions which have a resilience outside of government. So that's something that the GST Council do, kind of did. And uh, that's how I see it. Yeah. I think now thanks. Was, uh, thanks. Of the discussion. I think the main point that uh, as you made is well taken. That lots of changes have taken place, particularly after 1991. And it's important to think of uh, state control over resources, monetary policies, and uh, regulatory bodies, very important issues. Yeah, that I think is uh, uh, then kind of a debate. But still, but yeah, to Look at this in the background of the politics. Yeah, the nature of the regime or the where I think the spirit of subnationalism that is still prevalent. Yeah, <laughs> is very very important. Yeah. Now, can you think of dividing up uh, Tamil Nadu? The suggestion was. No, no, taken back <laughs> in a half. Or Kerala, no, Karnataka, at one time thought uh, not uh, Andhra also, but okay, the two. So, South India, Northeast India, they have an uh, element of Jammu uh, and Kashmir also. You <laughs> are from Kerala and Karnataka. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, and, no, this is very, very important to conceive in terms of federalism, in terms of. Uh, the distinct regional identity is that to exist in them. That is the, the background. But still, I would uh, urge you to look at the debates that happened in the 63rd, 64th constitutional amendment, where it was used as a ploy to make infringement of the state rights. Yes. There is nothing. To prevent the states from fighting. No, National Finance Commission comes, 
both the finance commission you cannot put separate conditions union finance ministry put conditions so that should be a common stand to be taken by this what i'm saying is strengthening local governments is not going to weaken the states that takes place a process independently say independently the fact of the matter is Today, nobody thinks about local government. 73rd, 74th constitutional amendments, 25th, 30th anniversary is, uh, it, uh, is, is coming in. Is anybody, what about? Not even Congress is celebrating it. The 20th anniversary, was it uh, they thought about, discussed anywhere? So, decentralization in the, is not in the regime's uh, menu, agenda. I, the virtually the Panchayat Raj Ministry was under my <laughs> So uh, I think um, you slightly overdid, uh, overdid a little bit on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, you know, not only just the optics in terms of practical fight to take forward this crisis. I don't know why you will have to argue the way you argue. Only that. Otherwise, yeah. So I think it's uh, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just uh, I just, I just wanted uh, to say hello to Hasid. This is Mridul, Mridul, Ipen, Hasid. Just want to say hello to Hasid. Just want to say hello to Hasid. Can you see me? Can you see me? Okay, doesn't matter. So hello, doesn't matter. Hello, and, uh, and uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful, wonderful to see. You. Uh, wonderful to see. You, you didn't raise your hand, and it's, or I, I, missed, I missed. I missed. I missed. It. It. I missed it. I came right to the end. I came right to the end. I somehow I missed it. Somehow I missed it. I missed. Okay, Hasib, all the best. Hasib, all the best. Yeah. A lot of thanks to the distinguished members of the dais, uh, I think, sir, for the profound lecture on fiscal federalism and Thomas Isaac, sir, for sharing this session. Also to the audience, our neighboring institute, Gulati Institute, have come in large number. Let it be the students, faculties, the director himself have come in a large number. And all the students, all the supporting staff, all those who have joined online, thank you.